great to be here and to be able to talk to you about, uh, I guess, the, the latest uh, operational telescope in South Africa, uh, which has been a sort of precursor to what um, Rene has talked about with the SKA. The success of SALT has really led, I think, to the success of the bid for SKA. So I'm going to cover quite a few topics. I'm not going to uh, dwell on these, otherwise um, we'll be getting too hungry to uh, pay much attention. Um, so it will be quite a range of different uh, areas that I'm going to cover in this talk, uh, and I'll end up with a little bit about the view to the future. So <clears throat> telescopes, um, we know that they've been around for over 400 years, uh, and the last uh, couple of decades has seen the development of uh, truly large telescopes, jumping up to 10 metre diameter telescopes, compared to Galileo's first uh, telescope that was used for astronomy, uh, it represents something like a 70,000 times collecting area uh, with these modern 10 metre telescopes. Uh, and of course in the future we're going to have even larger ones uh, in the next uh, decade or two, uh, the era of what's called the extremely large telescopes, uh, of which uh, some examples are the one that the Europeans are building, the European Extremely Large Telescope, and the US, the 30 metre telescope. Um, so we all know what telescopes are. This audience, uh, I think, realises that uh, basically they're just used to create or form an image of a distant object, and that image is then put on something. And of course, in the time of Galileo, it was the retina of his eye. In uh, times gone by, uh, it's moved on to the latest technologies for detecting photons. So photographic plates were the first sort of uh, detectors after the eye, and then with the development of the photoelectric effect, photomultiplier tubes, and then later with the development of CCDs and and uh, uh, semiconductor devices, that's where we're at at the moment. So we've gone a long way from Galileo's telescope to this potential, which will be uh, truly the largest optical telescope in the world when it's completed, the European Extremely Large Telescope. Just as an example, this is an Airbus A340 on the scale of this um, telescope. So. <coughs> How did we make this big jump? I mean, technology has been driving the development of telescopes uh, ever since the invention. But uh, SALT represents a, a new sort of uh, uh, use of technology, particularly in the area of what's called segmented mirrors. Uh, other large telescopes of the sort of 8 metre class have been developed which use different technologies. These are thin meniscus mirrors, a thin sheet of glass, supported with active uh, actuators that keep that piece of glass in an accurate figure, or these types of mirrors which are spun cast, a honeycomb sort of structure, which are stiff but quite lightweight, and these have been used in, in a variety of uh, eight metre class telescopes, but nothing really can be um, made larger as a single monolithic mirror. You just get to the limit of how big you can transport the thing when you take it to another observatory, never mind making a furnace big enough to cast mirrors bigger than that size. So really the larger mirrors are all going to be of this nature, the segmented mirror telescopes. Um, other innovations apart from mirrors have come in the mounts, how we actually uh, mount these telescopes. And these are two examples of novel mounts that have been developed. Uh, the top one is the design and the bottom is a picture of the same thing, not what's known as the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona. It's actually two 8.4 metre telescopes on a single mount. So both telescopes look at the same object at the same time, but they have different instruments on them, so you have a wide range of different capabilities. SALT and its precursor, the Hobby Eberly Telescope, are really quite a novel design for optical telescopes, and I'll be talking more about the, the, the design of SALT in a moment. But basically, it broke the cost curve of constructing large telescopes, which is the reason why South Africa could even afford to get into this uh, area of building a 10-metre class telescope. It costs about a fifth of a normal telescope to, design, uh, to build compared to uh, conventional telescopes. So the reason being that this 
steel structure here, which in most telescopes has to move with respect to gravity, like in the LBT, these telescopes tip over. The engineering involved in having to deal with the flexure of metal as you change it with respect to gravity is a big challenge, and it's expensive and difficult to build something that does not flex. So the fact that, that SALT and the HET have this fixed altitude, it's only tipped over at one angle, 37 degrees to the zenith, means you don't have to worry about all of these complications of, uh, of gravity. You have to worry about other complications, but in the scheme of things, they're easier to handle, uh, and that's what makes this telescope a very cost-effective design. So when SALT was completed, it joined uh, three other, or four really, other um, telescopes, if you count the two Keck telescopes as separate. Uh, they were the, obviously the first ones to uh, to actually pioneer the use of segmented mirror telescopes in this manner. And uh, here they are on the mountain of Mauna Kea in, uh, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, and they were finished in the uh, late 90s, as you can see. The next one to come along with HET in Texas. And this pioneered, as I say, this new type of optical um, and uh, uh, mechanical design. Uh, it was followed by SALT uh, in 2005, when the construction period finished on SALT here. And then more recently, Grantacan is a sort of a northern hemisphere or Spanish equivalent of the Keck telescopes uh, in Tenerife. But SALT is the only 10 metre class telescope in the southern hemisphere, so um, the largest single telescope in the southern hemisphere. And if you just want to look at the sort of league rankings of the largest telescopes, optical telescopes in the world, then currently the first place belongs to the LBT because it's basically two 8.2 metre telescopes equivalent to a 12 metre telescope, followed by Grantacan and then the two Kecks, which mostly operate as individual telescopes but can be combined into interferometry and act as a 4 metre, 14 metre telescope in that case. SALT is down at uh, number four uh, as being a, uh, a 10 metre telescope, but not quite a 10 metre because we don't use the entire 10 metre aperture because of the nature of the entrance pupil of the telescope. The same as HET is, is in the same uh, category. So we're, we're more like a 9 uh, or even 8.5 metre telescope. Subaru, um, VLT, Gemini, these are all monolithic single mirror telescopes, not segmented mirror telescopes. Uh, and of course the VLT, which is four uh, eight metre telescopes, when they are combined, which is when they do interferometry, uh, they're equivalent to a 16.4 metre telescope. So it all came, well, SALT all came from the success of, of, uh, of the HET. Uh, in pioneering a new design. This shows the, uh, the telescope in West Texas. Uh, I think we're at a slightly better um, location than Texas. You can see from the fact that it's quite green in that previous image. There's uh, lots of trees around here which we certainly don't have in Sutherland. And it's based on this sort of novel design that was pioneered by the uh, Arecibo radio telescope where you had a fixed dish and you track the object as the Earth rotated, not by rotating the dish or moving the dish, but by following the image created by it at the focal plane. So here up at the top, there's this curved spherical um, gantry here that allows the feed horn to follow as the image moves across the sky. And of course, this telescope's pointing at the zenith, which is very different to salt, which is tilted over, the reason being that when you just point at the zenith, you only sample a small strip of the sky of objects that happen to move through the zenith. So for an optical telescope, you can afford to tilt it over and then be able to move it in azimuth, which will give you a much greater um, window of opportunity to uh, get things on the sky. So the principle is the same as the Arecibo. You've got a spherical mirror here. Uh, the image of a star moving across the sky is formed on the curved focal plane and as you can follow with your detector or instruments on that focal plane then you can continuously track until uh, the object moves out of the field of view of the telescope. Uh, and that's really the principle of SALT is just, uh, and HET, it's just a, uh, an optical analogue of the Arecibo radio telescope. 
So these are the basic attributes, and all of these four different areas um, uh, are basically sort of summarizing the characteristics of the telescope. It's 91 individual mirrors, but they're not parabolas. We all know that uh, for most telescopes, we have to have a parabolic primary mirror mm -hmm. so that all of the rays uh, from the outside of the mirror and the inside of the mirror come to a common focus. With a spherical mirror, that doesn't happen. The rays from the outside come to a focus further in than the rays from the centre. And that's called spherical aberration. Why did we build a telescope with inherent spherical aberration? Well, the reason is you can build a, um, a, a spherical mirror very, very cheaply and very, very easily. It also means that there's no preferred position in the telescope array. You can take a mirror in the centre, it'll be exactly the same as a mirror on the outside. It's not the case with the Keck telescopes where they're parabolic uh, mirrors and they have to stay at a particular radius from the centre of the mirror array. So again, this was uh, a choice made by the HET followed by SALT to have a simple optical design that was cost effective. What it does mean is that you have to correct for the spherical aberration, and that's the heart of the optical design of, uh, of SALT. So the other strange thing about it is because this tracker moves to follow the image of the telescope, I'm um, sorry, the image of the star as, as the Earth rotates, uh, it means that the area of illumination on the mirror by the uh, object by the star or galaxy changes with time as the track proceeds. You can see this yellow circle is what we call the entrance pupil of the telescope and as the tracker moves across it migrates across the um, centre of the telescope mirror array. So it means that the collecting area of the telescope is changing with time. That's a bit of a nuisance because if you want to do photometry you need to account for the varying efficiency of the telescope and you also have to baffle the telescope to make sure that no light coming from this part of the pupil that falls onto the floor here for example uh, gets into the instruments otherwise um, a careless astronomer wandering with his torch on the floor inside the dome uh, could end up with light in the, um, uh, in, the tele in the instrument so there's a baffle up at what, right up at what we call the exit pupil which stops that stray light so this shows the, how the collecting area does change with time. Uh, and so this is sort of an example of a particular track. You can see a track lasts for maybe uh, just under uh, two hours or so in this particular azimuth. It's generally about one hour tracks to three hour tracks, depending mm -hmm. on the um, position in the um, declination, uh, declination dependent. And this shows the sort of window of, uh, of the telescope, it's this annulus, so only between the two blue circles can we observe an object at any given time if you're plotting our angle against declination. So you can see for objects that are in say the, uh, the north here at say uh, the equator, you've got a potential to track it for maybe three hours, just over three hours here. For objects down in the south, at the right declination, minus 65, say the Large Magellanic Clouds, you can actually track that at the right time of year for about six hours in total, but not with a continuous track. You have to move the telescope every couple of hours to catch up with the object as it moves. So we have to schedule observations, obviously, when they're inside that viewing window. Otherwise, we just don't uh, get an opportunity. We can't observe out here, and we can't observe in here, closer to the zenith. So this is a critical planning tool for being able to uh, uh, schedule the observations. And we lovingly know this diagram in the SALT operations division as the SALT toilet seat diagram. <laughs> Now, as you can see, the time changes with declination, and if you make this a three-dimensional plot now and show the time that you have, um, then you turn it into this diagram where that's the same annulus uh, projected onto this plane, but in the, uh, in the third dimension now we're plotting the total time available at that particular uh, declination or, or uh, hour angle. And this is obviously known as the salt training potty diagram. <laughs> For those of you who have children or grandchildren that are small enough to recognise that structure. 
And this is just a cross-section through that training potty diagram showing this large peak, as I said, over six hours in the south and also in the north. But for most objects, we only have like an hour or two um, observation time. So we have this tool which allows us to predict how long we have to observe an object. And this is just an example of a, a source, a target of opportunity, an X-ray pulsar that was observed last night. Um, and this parabola here represents the air mass versus time. And it doesn't really, I might turn this light and put the other one on. Uh, um, is that possible? Turn it down here. Yeah, okay. Um, so, <clears throat> what you can't see so well is there's a, a band here uh, of air mass which represents that central part of the annulus. So, you can only observe it when it's above about this air mass of uh, 1.38 uh, or something like that. Um, and so, it's telling you that if you get onto it at midnight, you have 9,510 seconds to observe this particular object with that coordinate. This is also just general information about sunrise and set and the phase of the moon and so on. We also have what's called a track length diagram which uh, is this one here which tells you at the same time that you decided you might want to start observing at midnight you have this 9510 seconds available which is all of this integrated. If you started say uh, an hour later you'd have half that time left just simply because it's moved through that annulus. Uh, and then also for planning purposes we have the same visibility tool which shows uh, the green band here, the total visibility during the year, so the object sort of available from the end of May um, through to say December here. Uh, and then these little yellow stripes are when it's uh, full moon, so this show just shows the lunation going through the year and obviously the, the change in, in time just represents summer and winter. So with these tools and the following one, this is a, a dynamic tool that shows uh, this particular case at uh, 23.37 last night. Um, all of these are different programs which are in the queue. These are all targets that could potentially be observed at any one time. And the one that I was interested in, the one that I showed you the diagrams for, is this one up here in the small Magellanic Cloud. So we have to be very clever in the way we um, uh, cue the observations for SALT because we just have a limited time to do it. And obviously we want to do it in an efficient manner as possible. Uh, just talking a little bit about the comparison of SALT to other telescopes from an operational sense. As I say, efficiency is important. Uh, we have a designed efficiency to do science for the combination of these two numbers here. Um, so this is like when you start to do an observation, we count that as doing science, even if we don't get photons coming through to the instrument yet because the telescope's setting up. Um, but the combined number here is 65%. That's the expectation if you take into account bad weather, which we lose typically quarter of the time for bad weather, technical problems and other engineering work, um, then we expect to be 65%. This number for the last um, quarter um, has been more like 40% because the number here, the statistics that we've had for weather, has been consistently worse uh, over the last um, four quarters. So um, as far as uh, design of uh, SALT, I'm not going to go through these in any great detail, but obviously following on from an existing telescope, the Hobby Ebley telescope, there were many lessons that we could learn from that. It was the first time that type of design had ever been done, and so obviously there are things that don't work out as expected, and there's an opportunity to, to sort of uh, take a step back and look uh, to see how you might improve the design, and that's exactly what the engineers and astronomers did. Um, and one of the main design changes was in the spherical aberration corrector, this device that has to correct for the fact that you've got this 10 metre spherical mirror, which at best would deliver an image about 10 arc minutes in diameter. That would be the best image quality with that mirror if you had no corrector. That's a third the size of the full moon. Hopeless, right? I mean, you know what that would look like. It'd be just big blobs. So we have this um, <coughs> corrector which is uh, 
correcting for this <laughs> spherical aberration, this is showing what happens to the rays uh, when you don't correct if you want a situation like this where it all comes to a perfect point here, like with a parabola. And so with salt, we have to use a corrector that takes this spherical aberration where you only get a, a blob of light here and bring it to a point. And that's this four mirror, four reflections, uh, which are used to correct for the spherical aberration. Very different design than the one that was done on HET. This was done by Dara Donahue, an astronomer at the observatory here. Uh, and we had, fortunately, the luxury of spending about a year to look into the whole problem uh, of designing the optics for this. This was a bit of a rush job, which is why it wasn't optimal. So with our design, we have much better imaging quality. These are little boxes, one arc second in size, and these are the theoretical uh, images produced by this compared to this diagram up here for the HET. So you can see for a start that the imaging quality is much better, but an added bonus is the field of view of the telescope is four times bigger in area than it was with the HET. Also, we have this large distance from the, uh, from the aberration corrector to the focal plane, which means we have more room to put in different instruments. That shows the design and one of the mirrors of the aberration corrector. And another thing that we've used is new types of mirror coatings that combine the advantages of both aluminium, which is what's used in most telescopes these days, and silver, which is particularly advantageous for the, um, the longer wavelength reflectivity, aluminium being good at shorter wavelengths. So these mirrors in the set, there's four of them, have to be highly efficient so as we just have as much uh, reflection as possible because there are five reflections before the photons end up at the instrument otherwise. Um, so these mirrors have reflectivities up at about the 98% level. So the telescope itself can be broken down into these different subsystems here um, and all of these were basically designed uh, and then built and put together by a project team that was appointed towards the end of 99, early 2000. Uh, to see all of these systems come together and most of these were uh, contracted to South African industry, particularly the telescope building, the structure and dome, uh, the tracker, the payload. Uh, the mirrors themselves were made uh, overseas. Uh, they were mirror material sourced in Russia and the mirrors actually ground and polished in the um, United States. But all the software, all the telescope control software was all done in-house. Um, and so all of the different subsystems were broken down into different areas and each of them assigned a project manager, uh, an engineer who took responsibility, as we say, cradle to grave responsibility for doing all of the initial design work, going out on tender, managing the contracts, seeing it commissioned, it tested and integrated and so on. So salt, the sort of salt science that, um, that this telescope is designed for uh, is a multitude of different things, but these are some of the highlights, some of the areas that are the partners which are bought into salt, which are 12 different partners from around the world, apart from South Africa, well, including South Africa. Um, they wanted to be able to have a telescope that could do survey spectroscopy to follow up on a lot of the new telescope missions that are taking images of the sky at whatever wavelengths, x-rays from satellites outside of the Earth's atmosphere to the new infrared surveys that are being done in Chile now. But to do the follow-up with spectra, because the spectra really give you the, the physical information, the astrophysical information. Uh, another thing was to really push the time variability studies. This is a, a relatively new frontier of astronomical research to see how things vary fast in time. And many other telescopes don't have the capability of you know, less than a, you know, maybe 20 second integration. We are able to do things down to uh, 80 millisecond integrations to look at how things vary on a fast time scale. And then we also had some unique capabilities like polarimetry and so on, which are generally um, fairly rare on large telescopes, and also pushing down to the ultraviolet, to the other end of the spectrum where most people concentrate, which is the infrared. That area where the ozone layer just lets through the photons for your um, instruments. 
So this is a sort of wide range of science goals and this sort of informed the design uh, and the choice of the first uh, generation instruments to go on the telescope. Uh, and the first two instruments uh, that were on the telescope was Salticam, which is effectively a very fancy digital video camera, uh, or stills camera, it can integrate as well, uh, and the Robert Stobie spectrograph, uh, which is a, a very complex multi-mode spectrograph that enables you to do many different types of observations, including what I just said about polarimetry and other types of observations. The third um, first generation instrument, which is not yet completed because at the time we didn't have the money for it, uh, but is now in construction, is a fiber fed instrument called a high resolution spectrograph. And that's currently being assembled in Durham in the UK and is expected to be delivered sometime early next year to begin commissioning on salt. So these are the three instruments and some of the observations uh, science that we've done so far with SALT that I'll be talking about will be on these two instruments, SALTICAM and, and the Robert Stobie spectrograph. SALTICAM is shown here, this is the design, that's the principal investigator, Darrow O'Donoghue, wearing the commissioning astronomer's hat. Um, and uh, it's basically just a, a very fancy digital camera that has the ability to have very short uh, exposures. Uh, and so fulfills a role both as a sort of acquisition camera but also as a, a very good uh, scientific instrument. This shows it being tested on the lab before it was installed. And then the second, and actually the workhorse instrument of the telescope is this instrument called the Robert Stobie spectrograph. Ken Nordsiak here is the PI, the principal investigator from Wisconsin. This shows the instrument being uh, tested in the spectrometer room at SALT and then lifted onto the telescope, looking down onto it after it had been uh, initially installed. And as I say, it has many different modes to allow astronomers to do the multitude of different observations that they would like to do. And then the third instrument, which as I just mentioned is under construction, is this high resolution spectrograph, uh, which is shown here in optical design, but is all inside this vacuum tank. Uh, and the reason it's in a vacuum tank is to make it incredibly stable. So there are no pressure variations, <coughs> no temperature variations. And for the sort of observational work that this instrument will do, which is uh, partly, or well, a lot of it, will be looking at uh, extrasolar planets, looking at the radial velocities caused by the wobble of uh, extrasolar planets. This is absolutely crucial. So this instrument won't be on the telescope like the other two mounted up at the uh, tracker. It will instead be in a room underneath the telescope fed by optical fibres. So this is just a quick uh, slideshow showing how things came together at SALT. This is before 2000 when the initial um, uh, groundwork began. Uh, and then two years later, uh, the building was completed. It was a shell inside, but the building itself and the dome was completed. Inside then came the, uh, the mirror support system, this sort of jungle gym frame here, which is a stiff um, uh, but lightweight system to support the mirrors. On top of this surface, each of the 91 mirrors are then mounted, but not directly via a mount like this, which is a, a nine-point wiffle tree. Some of you all know, have heard that term before, even for small telescopes. So there are nine points of support on the back of the mirror, um, and this is a typical mirror blank uh, following its uh, figuring and so on. Um, this is made from a special low-expansion glass ceramic that won't change its shape with temperature. Uh, material that was sourced in Russia uh, at about half the cost of, uh, of uh, other uh, materials conventionally used. And this just shows one of the mirrors uh, being lifted into the telescope. The heart of the telescope, the whole way in which it tracks and observes is the tracker, which is shown here being lifted in, or the tracker bridge in September 2003. And then here it is inside the telescope with what we call the payload, where we have the cameras, uh, all of the instrumentation, the prime focus spectrograph, the Robert Stovey spectrograph is situated up here. So all of this came together in uh, early 2005. The final mirrors came in place uh, in May 2005 and the real commissioning observations began at that time. 
this shows the sort of details up at the prime focus with the uh, Robert Stovey spectrograph shown on top here. Uh, and all of this moves um, in all six degrees of freedom, as we say. It moves in X, Y, and Z, and rotates about all of those six axes to an accuracy of about five microns in space, which is what you need to have perfect image quality. So there's the completed mirror array looking pristine. Um, it got quite a bit degraded over time before we had the mirror cleaning system installed, but now it's back to its pristine looking state. Uh, and the observations began in earnest. And the way this telescope is operated is by uh, an astronomer shown here and an operator who between them run the telescope all night long. And the first images were back in September of 2005, the first light images, which showed you know, reasonable looking image quality uh, and performance. So uh, the end of that year was when it was inaugurated. Here's a nice image showing it on the plateau. It was a big event, over 2,000 people came, the president came to open it. It became a high profile and always has been positively seen, I think, by South Africa and the media, even to the extent of becoming lampooned in the uh, uh, political press um, at the time. And this is, of course, long before anyone knew that this gentleman would become um, the eventual president. Anyway. Everything looked like it came together very nicely. The construction phase was very nice, uh, fairly, fairly quick, five and a half years. But when we started to look closely at the images that the telescope was producing, uh, we discovered a couple of problems. The first one was that the images were not uniformly sharp. And the second one was that the spectrograph was not as efficient as we expected, particularly at the short wavelengths in the ultraviolet, where it was designed to be particularly good. When the project team left, most of the telescope was finished, but not all of it. So a number of subsystems had to be completed by the operations teams. And during that period, we also came across a third problem, namely that the mirror edge sensing system, which is the, the system that keeps all those 91 mirrors in perfect alignment, did not work to specification. And it meant that this system, which is the original system with little capacitive sensors glued to the edges of the mirror, had to be scrapped in 2005. It basically, sorry, 2008. We basically gave up on it ever being able to do what it was designed to do, mostly because of the environment in which these capacitive sensors were operating, high humidity and dust. So we've now moved on to a new type of sensor shown here in testing. Um, and it's based on a different <clears throat> type of mirror sensing technology. These are the gaps that are uh, detecting very small motions both um, in the X plane and in the Z um, to measure how the mirrors are moving with respect to each other and feed that information back into a control system that can then realign the mirrors about every two minutes. That's the design of the system. So because that hasn't been operating, we've been having to realign the mirrors optically maybe several times, many times during a night if there's a large temperature gradient. That will change in about um, a year's time when we install these new sensors, which will maintain the image quality for much, much longer. This just shows some of the poor images in the worst case when, when we... Um, we're doing this diagnosis, and you can see that these images out here, these stars are out of focus, more out of focus compared to the ones in here. Um, and it wasn't repeatable. It would change to different places at different times, and it took a long time to diagnose what the problem was, which was basically finally resolved to be in the interface of that spherical aberration corrector with the rest of the telescope. Here is the spherical aberration corrector, the four mirrors are all mounted in this cylinder and then it's bolted onto the telescope with a flange sort of up here. This shows the, the uh, system in France under test. Um, and, but on the telescope what was happening was the mounting flange here um, was buckling like a potato chip. And this is an extreme finite element analysis model showing how the, the warping happened. Uh, and that warping would distort the mirror's alignment causing this bad image quality. So it was all resolved by changing that interface to something that had a separate collar to avoid this distortion. Um, 
we knew that really the mirrors weren't to blame because we have had good image quality even during this time. These are good images in the central part of the field with sub-arc second um, sized images. But most of the time it wasn't like that. It was more like this where you see these funny chromatic looking images at the edge of the field. So after the fix it went from being like that which we could still do signs. We were doing signs on these images. In the center of the field, you could get pretty good imaging, um, but uh, still compromising what you could do to, after the fix, that, which is, as you can see, uniform image quality over the whole field of view. And that was basically achieved in the end by 2010. And since then, uh, the telescope was recommissioned. Uh, these are some recommissioning photos from Salticam. And then uh, the second problem with the spectrograph that I talked about is the uh, low throughput of the instrument. Uh, and that was also resolved by changing some of the optical components, the coupling fluids in the lenses, which were causing a major problem. So that was reinstalled about uh, uh, April last year, back onto the telescope. Uh, we got good images with the instrument, it showed that it was performing and you can see we had a minor celebration by throwing some sodium into a local dam at Sutherland and, uh, and drinking a lot. <coughs> and so that's a nice image taken through, not Salticam this time, but through the imaging uh, mode of the Robert Stoden spectrograph of, I think, Omega Centauri. This is like a two second exposure. So science, we have done science with, uh, with this telescope, I mean even back uh, in 2005 and 2006 when we were commissioning it, these observations I'll show you now are the first science <coughs> observations done which were testing out Salticam, this high speed imaging camera. And this is an object known as a magnetic cataclysmic variable where you have a, a very compact uh, hot white dwarf with a strong magnetic field accreting material from a much lower mass, much larger star. And this gas is being trapped by the field lines, following the field lines down onto the two uh, magnetic poles of the star. And the idea of these observations was to look to see if you could resolve the structure of these magnetic um, spots on the uh, surface of the white dwarf. And that's exactly what we did here. This is showing an eclipse of the limb of the red dwarf star as it goes across marching from left to right. First of all it covers up the bottom spot and then the top spot so the light curve drops 50% as, as it covers up the first spot and then uh, is uh, flat for a bit and then drops again as it covers up the second spot. The time scale that it takes to drop is only one, one, just over one second and that gives you the size of the accretion spot on the surface of the white dwarf. It's about the size of Greenland um, compared to the Earth, and the white dwarf is about the size of the Earth. So these are the best, highest quality observations of this sort ever done that show uh, the nature of what you can do with this uh, instrument in this area. This is another program done with our Polish um, uh, collaborators showing an asteroid. You can see this track here I've marked this is a near-Earth uh, object, and the idea here is to look at the uh, intensity variations which are shown here. This uh, large up and down intensity is due to the spinning of the asteroid. Uh, and so knowing more about these, particularly the, the nearer ones, is important to, to um, astronomers and I think the wider community if we know about potential collisions. Uh, this is some spectroscopy that was done highlighting the performance that the spectrograph, the RSS, can do. This was observations done of a colliding triple merger galaxy here, with these being the emission lines from uh, all the gas in inside here, showing actually that it dynamically consisted of not one galaxy, but three different galaxies coming together in a, in a collision. Uh, this shows an example of uh, an observation done during commissioning back in 2006 of a gamma ray burster. These are the most energetic events that happen in the universe, very distant um, objects in galaxies thought to be the collapse of massive stars into black holes. Uh, and this was a spectrum taken about uh, eight hours after the alert when this was first detected by an X-ray satellite when it was quite bright. It 
15th magnitude. By the time we got to observe it, eight hours later, it had gone down by five magnitudes, but we still got this nice spectrum showing it was a high redshift um, galaxy. These are some other observations taken, high resolution observations inside a, a molecular cloud and a, um, star forming region and a reflection nebula here by Ken Nordziak looking at particular UV lines which are uh, produced by far ultraviolet photons fluorescing the gas. Uh, and finally this is one showing multi-object spectroscopy. This is what René was talking about in the importance of following up from uh, Meerkat where you can look not just at one object at once but many objects at once, about uh, 30 objects here. And this is detecting little emission lines from planetary nebula uh, in this particular nearby um, galaxy. <clears throat> and then uh, this is an uh, image showing um, what Fabry Perot imaging spectroscopy does, where you can basically do multi filter, tunable filter observations of uh, different objects. And uh, you build up a sort of uh, data cube uh, showing how the object looks differently in different colours and you can use this to go from an image of a galaxy to a dynamical uh, velocity map where you can see how the gas is moving, the blue gas coming towards you, the red gas going away from you. Very similar to what the radio observations that René showed um, earlier. Future instruments, um, sorry I just went on a bit too fast there. Um, <coughs> we all already have a uh, a second generation or, or what I refer to as generation 1.5 really because it was always designed in from day one to extend the capability of the Robert Stobie spectrograph into the infrared. Uh, we also have small niche instruments that we, uh, we can mount on the telescope and we have an example of one of those which is the Berkeley uh, visible image tube which is a, an even higher speed camera that can work down to 50 nanosecond time resolution not that you'd ever need to have that sort of time resolution you'd never get photons from anything at, at such a fast um, time speed but you can do microseconds and so on which is useful for say pulsar um, work and in the future we may do some experiments on uh, adaptive optics being able to correct for the uh, distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so there are plenty of plans in the future for instruments on SALT. Um, this just gives a sort of idea of how the RSS will evolve <clears throat> and become really the ideal astronomer's tools with all of these different modes uh, available to the astronomer with one single instrument. So just quickly, just to talk a little bit about the SALT commissioning experience. Um, <clears throat> it took about a year longer than the original project plan, which was, I think, uh, wildly optimistic to build a telescope in, uh, in five years. Um, and we came across a, a few issues on the way and, of course, in the end, had these other problems post-commissioning to deal with, like the image quality. And I think this all just reflects that this is not surprise. You know, you shouldn't be surprised by the fact that you didn't come along with the key, turn it on, on the day after inauguration and things just went smoothly from there. It's a first time experience for everyone involved in this project. Um, it's also because there's so many dependencies, various subsystems relying on other sub subsystems, it's always difficult when you multitask and try to schedule the completion, when you're reliant on so few people who have many different other responsibilities. So I think it highlights that probably we had a few, too few people in critical areas, particularly on the designing of the payload uh, and also on the designing of the optomechanics. Um, <clears throat> so my conclusion is that really in reality we probably needed an extra two or three engineers and probably needed about another year and maybe a little bit more. Um, money and we maybe would have been generating signs uh, a lot earlier than we have been. But as I say, you know, you learn by uh, hindsight and so I don't think any of this was really something we could have predicted from the beginning. Um, 
So yes, this just this little Dilbert cartoon just reflects the um, the healthy tension between the project manager, who was Corvus Maring, who went on to Optimal Energy to design an electric vehicle, and myself as project scientist about schedules and how we're going to get things finished and should we do should we have sort of realistic schedules or schedules that might have been perhaps in hindsight not so realistic. And sometimes it was just very tiring. I mean, it's a, a long job. I've been at this job now, it will be 14 years since the beginning of the project uh, in 98 when we were first putting, putting together these ideas of the telescope. So my last slide is just to say, I think, um, I hope from this talk you've understood um, about what SALT is, what it can do, um, what it took to, to put it together, uh, and what it took to solve the problems that we initially came up against. But the good news is that since September last year, we've been in full science operations. Every single night, we're delivering data for all of the astronomers in the partnership. Uh, and I think it's reflecting the fact that we've now transitioned, matured, to be a fully operational telescope. And if you ever have an opportunity to go to Sutherland to visit the telescope, I would highly recommend it and certainly... Uh, seeing the telescope operating is uh, something which is very heartening for astronomers to see how we purr along. I mean, I just looked at the night log before I came in here from last night from Petri Weissenden, the SALT astronomer. He said it was an absolutely perfect photometric night, sub-arc second scene, everything went smoothly. It was just fantastic. So, thank you. Dave, thank you very much indeed for a really wonderful, wonderful talk. And um, I know it's lunchtime, but I think we have one or maybe two questions. Depends how long the answers are. <laughs> You've blown them all away, Dave. <laughs> I've got a question. Yeah. The, the alignment of those mirrors. Yes. Uh, what accuracy is that being done? Yeah, it's, it's being done in, in um, what we call piston, which is you know, up and down height. Uh, to something not very high spec actually, it's uh, something like 20 microns RMS uh, because we're not trying to phase the mirror, it's not behaving like a 10 metre diffraction limited telescope so that aspect is, is not so crucial. The crucial aspect is the relative tip tilt of the mirrors and that has to be controlled to something like 0.05 arc seconds. So in other words, if you think of all of those um, mirrors as single mirrors generating an image of a star one arc second in size. The centroid of all of those um, one arc second images have to stack on top of each other to an accuracy of 0.05 arc seconds. And that's, that's what we achieve with an optical device in that funny tower that you see on the side of the telescope. There's a, what's called a wavefront camera. Beginning of the night, we align all those 91 mirrors. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to optically align them with a laser and then everything is stacked to that accuracy. And in an ideal world it, they would stay like that but because temperature changes and it's all sitting on steel and the steel is contracting and expanding it means the mirrors gradually start floating apart and are no longer aligned. And you can see it in the images over a period of time you'll start to see little satellite images when it's really grossly out of alignment then we have to go back and realign it. If we had edge sensors working now, we wouldn't have to worry about it. They would detect that motion and it would keep it aligned. And we'll have that situation, I hope, in just over a so year's time. So would be continuous? Yes, yeah, every two minutes it makes an adjustment and it's continuously <laughs> making measurements and, and averaging them throughout the night and the day, in fact, as well. Very quick one, Chris. How often do you uh, realign the mirrors every day? We do it every night, at the beginning of the night, and depending on how the temperature changes during the night, we may need to do it between once, like in the middle of the night, or maybe three or four times if there's a cold front that comes through or the temperature suddenly changes or something. How long does it take? About 20 minutes. Okay, now, sorry, can we speak to Dave during lunch, if you like, Dave? <laughs> sorry about that, we are run out of time, but Dave, thank you very much for okay. a wonderful talk. Small token of our appreciation. <laughs>